Today we're talking all about puzzle books and we'll be doing that with my friend Keith Wheeler from over at Keith Wheeler Books. Keith is a multi-award winning author first published at the age of 14. And since then, he's published over 250 books in a variety of genres and niches. And Keith's self-publishing expertise has allowed him to help countless others achieve their lifelong goal of becoming published authors as well. Through his YouTube channel and his 30-day coaching program, many of his students have gone on to become Amazon bestsellers themselves. Keith's publishing philosophy is simple. Everyone from seven to 107 has a book inside them that's waiting to come out, and he loves to help them on that journey. Keith is an expert when it comes to producing a profitable puzzle books through KDP, and he's gonna be sharing all that juicy knowledge with us today, so let's get to it. If you're new around here, my name's Rachel Harrison Sund, and I help people to create and sell journals, planners, notebooks, and more on the Kindle Direct publishing platform. If that sounds cool, please do subscribe. Don't forget to hit the bell so that you can be notified every time I put out one of these videos, which is each and every Monday. All right. Hello, Keith. Welcome back. It's so great to have you back on the channel again. I think it's been, what, probably about a year now or something like that. Yeah, yeah about that. It's, I'm glad to be here. Glad yeah, to be back. Well, I'm excited for you to share more of your puzzle book knowledge again, just like you did last time. Now, for those that aren't familiar with you or your channel, just briefly give us a little bit about your self-publishing background. Yeah, I've been self-publishing books since 2016. Um, I, I do children's books, young adult novels, um, and yeah, I've got no content, low content books out there. And then of course, puzzle books, which technically are no content books too, or low content books. But, um, but yeah, I've been doing this since 2016. And are, so are you publishing predominantly puzzle books at this stage, or is this just still sort of like just one arm of your overall, uh, catalog on KDP? It's, it's just, it's just one area that I'm working on. Um, it right now it is a, uh, more dominant than, than some of the other ones, but it's pretty much like when I'm working on low content books, it's pretty much puzzle books. I, I, the journals and stuff like that, I don't do too often anymore. Um, I may do some updates, but it's pretty much the puzzle books for that aspect. And then my written books, um, you know, I still do the children's books. I have a children's book that was, uh, traditionally published. So, but most of my stuff is self-published. Awesome. So, okay. For anyone that's kind of been thinking about doing puzzle books before, but haven't, why do you think that any low content publisher should get in on the uh, puzzle book market? There are really two big reasons um, in, in my book. One is uh, what I call spreading the love. Um, you know, a, a lot of times when you're doing any kind of book, but especially low content, no content books, you know, you've got, um, you know, a few books in your uh, underwater basket weaving genre that you're in. And, you know, you've got, you've got one or two planners or whatever that are, that are selling really well. You know, someone is, you know, they, they buy it, they consume it, then they like it. So they go back and buy that same one. Puzzle books are different in that while they're still consumables, they're one-time use consumables. So if someone goes out and buys your underwater basket weaving puzzle book, you know, once they're done with those puzzles, even though they liked it, they can't buy that same one. So then they'll buy another one of your other puzzle books right. in that, in that same, um, in that same niche. And so it's, instead of having just one or two that are doing kind of all your heavy lifting, it, it does what, you know, like I said, spreads the love, or, you know, so it's more, uh, more consistent sales, uh, across the entire series. If you do a series. Um, right. I mean, anyone that does puzzle books, I'm sure, you know, they're not going to stop at just one. I, right. Immediately, I just think about my dad who used to be obsessed with Sudoku to the point where my mom had to tell him to stop. <laughs> right. It yeah. was like, just became almost an obsession. He would just sit in the armchair for like two or three hours a day doing the, yeah, the Sudoku it's puzzle. crazy. And the other reason is, um, to diversify. Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of Puma shoes, the Puma brand. Oh yeah. Um, I've had a pair too. For I, sure. I'd never heard, I'd never heard of them. Nobody in my family had heard of them. Oh really? Um, <laughs> but my, my son, he, he was in about six months ago, he needed a, a new pair of socks and he really likes the Nike socks. So I'm at the sports store and I, I buy, um, I go to look at a pair of Nike socks and there's a pair of this brand Puma socks next to them and they're comparable in price. So I, you know, I grab the Puma ones and I feel them, they feel softer. So I'm like, I'll just get them those. And if he doesn't like them, I'll go back and I'll buy him a pair of Nike socks later. Well, he loves them. And those are like his, he loves them better than the Nike socks. So now fast forward to about two or three weeks ago, he's in the market for a new pair of shoes. And normally he would buy Nike shoes, but he bought a pair of Pumas. 
and so again a brand that of shoe that he he had never heard of before but because he found another comparable product you know complementary product that kind of led him into that so the same thing can be done with with books you know if you're you got planners someone might not find you from your planners especially if you're in a competitive niche but if you have a puzzle book in that same niche it can, you know, they can find you that way and then lead into your mm. other products. A gateway book. <laughs> gateway book. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So let's talk about brand names quickly. Um, are, do you publish all of your pub- puzzle books under one pen name or do you kind of uh, split them out over various pen names according to niche? Um, how do you tackle that? It, it really, it really depends on the niche. Um, if, if I already have a, a, a strong brand in that niche, then I'm just going to ride that wave and I'll use that same, that same, uh, brand name. But if it's a a new niche that I might be going into, um, I will, I won't use an already existing one. I'll create a new one for that. But a lot of it just comes down to, and this is with any brand, whether it's puzzle books or any kind of no content, low content books, or even written books. If you have multiple niches that you're doing and, they're, they cross each other and it makes sense, then yeah, you can do it under the same brand name. But if they're more conflicting, you know, like for example, if you're doing puzzle books that are, you know, more risque or an adult related, obviously you're not going to use the same brand name that you do for your children's books. Yeah. So, um, so it, it's really, we would hope it, not. <laughs> right. It's really, it's really going to be based on your, um, on your niche itself. But yeah, I do have multiple brands out there. Now, do you think that there, or have you found that there are any particular types of puzzle books that sell better than others, just in terms of, you know, crosswords versus Sudoku or, you know, word searches? Uh, Yeah. Um, Well, I mean, you just named the big three. Uh, Those (laughs) those three obviously are going to be your biggest sellers. Um, But just like with line journals, everybody has them. And so they're super competitive. Right. Um, And so, yes, they're going to be the most popular but for, especially for someone just starting in puzzle books, you know, doing a word search puzzle book, it's going to be very hard for you to be visible. Just like creating a line journal is going to be hard for that one line journal to be visible. Right. Um, but there are, so there are so many other puzzles out there and um, that people enjoy, but that just may not be as searched, but, um, but when they, when they find it or, you know, they're still just as voracious of a consumer. Right. Okay. So let's talk about keyword research for a second. Do you, do you go about your keyword research basically in the same way that you would do your research if you were doing, you know, a journal or you know, even your children's books or something like that? Or are there particular things to kind of watch out for when someone's doing keyword research for puzzle books? In general, it's pretty much very similar to what I do for my other no content, low content books or, or my written books. Um, one of the biggest differences is competition. Um, you know, um, when it comes to competition, I kind of relate it to romance novels in that you can be a little bit more lenient with what keywords you use as far as what the competition is. So like if I'm doing uh, a low content book normally, like for planners or whatever, when I look at the competition, I want it to be like a thousand competitors or less. But I, I'm willing to go 3,000, 5,000 competitors in a puzzle book because um, just kind of what you were saying about your dad, just like with romance novels, they're ver- most of them are very voracious consumers. Right. And so, you know, as much as you want to be on that first page placement, you know, it doesn't take long before these voracious consumers have already bought all those. And again, because they're one-time use, they can't rebuy that same one. And so the next thing you know, they're on page two, page three, and so on. So because of that, um, I'm a lot more lenient when it comes to my competition volume, when it comes to keyword research. That's but, interesting. That was actually going to be my next question was, you know, yeah. does competition matter as much just because of the consumable nature? So that's, that's interesting to know. Okay. So when you're putting these puzzle books together, do you tend to do variety books or do you, you know, one of them's, you know, word searches, the other one's Sudoku, um, or I imagine you probably experimented with all kinds. Do you find that one sort of does better than the other or um, do fans of puzzle books tend to, to 
pick and chew, like they've got their favorite one, you know, it's crosswords only, or do they tend to just, it doesn't matter as long as it's a puzzle. Well, you know, it's, there are people that are like that. There are people that just want a word search book, um, just want a Sudoku book, but I've found that my variety books are the ones that do the best for me. And the reason why is, uh, first of all, if you're creating just a word search book, forget the competition at this point, just the fact that the only people that are going to be interested in that book are word search people, word search fanatics. So people who like Sudoku's, they don't care about your book because it's only word searches. Whereas if you do a variety book, then even people who don't like word searches, if only you know 10% of your book is word searches, but they like the other stuff, or maybe there's some stuff in there that they've never even heard of, but but they do like Sudoku's and they do like, you know, the, uh, you know, whether it's cryptograms or whatever else you have in there, then, then they're willing to buy that. So you're opening up both with keywords because now you can, you know, right. go for word search, you know, keywords and Sudoku keywords and whatever else is in that particular puzzle book. But also, like I said, you know, there's, you're kind of feeding to all of them. And even if they don't like some of them in there, they're still willing to buy your book because they like the other stuff that's in there. So it, it, I find that you get a lot more variety of users. And as far as like creating unique, like books that are just on one topic, I have done that for the unique puzzles, but not for things like word searches, not for the ones that are super, super complex or super competitive and stuff like that. Right. Okay. So do you focus primarily on puzzle books for adults or have you, you know, dipped your toes into the children's market as well? And if so, which one do you have the most success with in general? I've done both. I've done both. Um, I, I find in general puzzle books sell better for the adults with, where with kids, it's more activity books. Right. You know, so you're talking about like tic-tac-toes and hangman and, you know, those kind of things, but the, the only thing that's a little bit different when it comes to children's books is um, like when you're getting older, like the young adults, uh, the, if you make puzzle books specifically for them, now that's really niching it down, but those do fairly well for me as well. Mm, yeah, that's a good point. Um, you could probably come up with some really interesting like themes and stuff. Actually, that's another question. Do you tend to try and apply different themes to your puzzle books just in terms of, you know, trying to niche down further. So, you know, it's not just a puzzle book, but it's a puzzle book with, um, I don't know, like a, a dog theme or something like that. Right. Like, is no, that, I, is that a way that you attempt to try and stand out? Absolutely. Um, and that's like with any, in my opinion, with any type of book you create, um, is you need to have a niche, you need to have some kind of theme around it. And, um, I, so yeah, I definitely, cause when you try to sell to everybody, you're selling to nobody yeah. and it also helps again with the keyword research, with narrowing it down and, and getting, uh, you know, lowering your competition because you're, you know, you're sub niching it down. So yeah, absolutely. Whatever the theme, you know, if we want to do one on dogs or just animals in general, um, and then, you know, theme based off of that, depending on, you know, you can also cross themes you know, like you can have, you know, cats with, you know, people who sew or whatever. Right. (laughs) That's really niching it down. (laughs) Um, Okay. So that sounds like it kind of, you know, might lend itself well to creating series. So do you, do you use that, the series uh, function for your uh, puzzle books? I do. I absolutely um, use a series because, you know, like I said, they're, because they're one-time use. I mean, if you only create one, then first of all, it's like, you know, eating a chip, you know, who wants to just do one, but, (laughs) but also, you know, if if it sells really well, that's great. But now they can't buy any of your other stuff because, you know, they're, so they're going to go on to your competitor now. Yeah. Later on, you can create more, but now they've already found your competitor and they may like them better. So the key is, is when you're, when they find you, you want to give them options. And so uh, I typically will start when I'm starting a new niche, I do three to five, uh, uh, in that series, because if you're going to, if you're going to do multiple ones in the same niche, then you might as well make it a series. So you can use that, you know, that series slot for some, some more keywords and, um, and, and have some continuity uh, amongst them. So people are more likely to, to purchase it. So yeah, I'll start with three to five. And then if they sell more then I'll do, 
you know, 10 or even 20 in that same series. And are you cross promoting those uh, different books in each series within each book, within each printed book, like somewhere yep. in the back or something like that? You've got, you know, the other three to five books in the series listed and where you can find them. Yes. Yeah. I'll, I'll do it. Some, sometimes I'll do it right now. I'm, I'm kind of playing around with whether I do it just in the back or if I do it in the front and the back. Um, and I really haven't seen any, um, any significant difference. So right now I'm just most of the time, just put it in the back. But yeah, absolutely cross promoting also um, without even putting it on the inside, cross promoting it by the cover, making sure that there's continuity across all of them, right. um, you know, and I just call it, you know, one volume one volume two and so on. And it's good because not unlike a written series, they don't have to do it in sequential order. So they might find your book eight in right. you know volume eight in that series, and then they can go back and get any of the other Number ones. seven. Have. <laughs> are you using a plus content now that that's kind of opened up to us? Have you used that to, to try and promote books within a series as well, or are there other puzzle uh, books within your brand? Yeah, I've actually, um, I've really started playing around with that. Um, it, I find it really helpful with the series because you can, you can list, especially if you're doing a variety puzzle books, like I do, because you can list in the a plus content. Um, you can do the, the little charts that they have there and show what puzzle types, all the puzzle types you offer between, across all, let's say 10 books and, you know, have a check, you know, a yes or a no on which ones are included in each of those books. Right. And so oh, that yeah, way, that's great. And, and that does multiple things. One, if they find one of your puzzle books and they see that, you know, they, they know that there's a specific game type that they like, they can see what other puzzle books in your series have it, but also they can see a list of all the puzzle types that you offer, even if they're not in that particular book that they happen to have clicked on. Right. So oh, that's really handy. Yeah. So I found that extremely helpful. So, okay. How long have you been using uh, a plus content in this way so far? And have, have you noticed an uptick in sales that, that it's actually, you know, are you seeing any tangible results from that yet? Or is it still kind of too new to um, have that information? No, I've, I've started using it pretty much as soon as we could. Um, and so it's been, I don't know, it's been months, if not longer, but, um, I've, I've found, especially in, in you know, specific niches, um, that it is, it has helped quite a bit. Um, especially when I add in new books to a series, like if I notice that, uh, you know, I started off with, let's say five in the series and I'm getting some sales and then I, I add the A plus content in addition to my other books that I've done and, while the ones that I had originally are still getting consistent sales, I've noticed the other ones are getting more. And I, I really, I've noticed, especially based on the, the comments that people are putting, you know, the, the um, actual reviews, that there are certain ones that have certain types of puzzles. And I, I can see an increase in sales related to just those spe specific books in that series. So the only thing I could think of is that it has to you know, it, it probably has a lot to do with the A plus content, unless they're just happen to be going through all of them and looking at the, you know, what's included, which just seems a lot more tedious than what the normal consumer would do. Yeah, well, that seems great, then, because I mean, it's a little bit of effort to get that initial piece of A plus content going. But I mean, I'm assuming you, you've got that one thing of A plus content, and then you're just using that across the entire brand. Exactly. Right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, you create it's just, it's just like with, with, you know, puzzles or, you know, planners or whatever, it takes you a little bit of time to put that first one together. But once you do, it's just use it across all of them. Um, and like I said, it's, it, it, I found it really helpful because in most of my, like, if I'm doing a series, I may have 10 to, to 20 different puzzle types that I'm including, but each book is only going to have maybe 10 different puzzle types. So now they're able to see all the other 10 that they're not getting in that book, but they can get in the next one. Right. Yeah, that's very good. Let's talk about length of the book for a second. How many puzzles do you tend to put in each book? I typically will do um, 108 seems to be like my the, the KDP number that I like. Um, after 108 pages, you start paying, a, uh, I think it's like an extra penny right. per page in production. Um, obviously, it's not coming out of your pocket, but it's coming out of your royalties. And so what I found is I usually do 100 pages of uh, in my puzzle book, which is 10 pages for 10 different puzzle types. It's typically what I do. 
Okay. So that's quite a, quite a number of puzzles that you've got going in each book. Right. Yeah. Um, are you creating all of these puzzles by hand or do you use software or? I, I definitely use software. Um, there, there are some softwares out there that I, I love to use. Um, but, um, there are, there are puzzle types that I, you know, don't exist in any software. And so those I'll create myself. Luckily, a lot of them, um, you can templatize. And so it takes a little bit of time. Like I said, with the planners, same thing, you know, it takes some time to create that first one, but after that you can, um, knock them out a lot quicker. Right. And plus it, plus a lot of it just comes from experience after you've done, done them for a while. Yeah. After you've done your, you know, 3000th puzzle, I'm sure you got a system <laughs> down pretty well. <laughs> yeah, pretty well. <laughs> so what about price? What's your pricing strategy? Typically my books, uh, go about eight ninety nine. Although in some of my niches, I do have books that are fourteen ninety five and even now nineteen ninety five um, on oh. uh, for for a single puzzle book, and still that one hundred and eight pages. Um, you know, it's not one of those you know three hundred whatever page books. So I mean, you're talking. Uh, I wrote it down because I figured you might ask. I mean, you're talking nine dollars and eighty two cent royalty. Um, yeah, that's for, for one sale. Yeah, that's really great. I mean, for me, I try to ensure that my royalties are around two dollars. <laughs> Nine right. sounds very appealing. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, and don't get me wrong. Most most of my books are around the eight ninety nine mark. Yeah. Um, you know, and it, it's just gonna it's gonna come down to the what I do for whatever type of book I'm doing is you know look at your competition, see which one you know how much they're charging you know competition as far as like the ones that are actually selling, and just to see what the consumers are get, are used to. But knowing that in my books, I'm offering puzzle types that my competitors aren't, I typically can come in a little bit higher. Yeah, that's great. So what percentage of your books make sales? I know this is a, a question that people want to know the answer to. Are you experiencing sales pretty evenly across everything? Or do you experience like what I do and what other people do, sort of that 80-20 rule where you've got 20% of all of your books generating 80% of all of your royalties? Uh, the short answer is both. Um, the uh, the 80 20 rule still comes into effect when it comes to um, at the niche level, you know, some niches just sell better than others. Um, but within a niche, in a series, it's pretty consistent. Because like I said, they're one time use. So they they can't keep buying that same one over That's and over again. That's what I was again. wondering. I was wondering yeah. if just because of the nature of puzzle books, if that rule kind of goes out the window, because it's like once you've once you've gone through the one, and suddenly you want another one, and you're kind of you're more apt to just burn through an entire series. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so so again, within you know across my series, you know, or across my niches, some niches are you know you know twenty percent are bringing in eighty percent of the profit. But within that niche, the, the puzzle books sell pretty evenly. I mean, there may be a little bit of a tick higher in some of the puzzle types, but in general, they're pretty, pretty even. Do you have a marketing strategy for these books? What, what do you tend to do once they're up? Or are you um, just sitting publish and then sitting back and watching your bank account fill up? <laughs> <laughs> publish, and pr publish and pray. No, I definitely don't publish and pray. Um, <laughs> So, so I, I do a couple things. Um, we talked about one of them, which is the cross promoting within the book itself. Um, you know, and then again, the, the covers making sure that they, that there's some continuity. So just by visually looking at them, people can see that the other ones exist. A plus content, absolutely helpful. Um, Amazon ads. I use those. Uh, the difference is with Amazon ads. Um, I only run ad to one book in a series. I don't need to run it to all of them because right. again, again, one time use. So there's, there's no sense in me sending it to, to multiple ones. And then the third thing is that I think is highly underrated, especially when it comes to no content and low content uh, publishers is my email list. Yes. <laughs> yes. So are you sending regular uh, marketing emails then? Yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll send them um, at least once a month. Um, I, whether it's, you know, sometimes I'll, I'll do a, a discount, um, on, a you know, a book that I've already done. Uh, sometimes I'll send out just a, a free PDF of uh, a puzzle type that I'm testing out to see if it, you know, especially if it's a new one, 
a new puzzle type that I haven't tried yet, you know, I'll, I'll send it to my email subscribers and see what, what they think, what their feedback is uh, before I even try, before I even try it in, in a book. Um, and I also make sure that I let them know that this is something never, you know, this is a new one. So when people hear new, you know, they're, you know, they, you know, they think they're basically like a, they're basically beta testing it for you. So, um, I do that. And then I, you know, I'll give them updates on any new ones that are in the works. So. And do you ask your list for reviews for new books? I do. Um, if, if they, and I don't do, <laughs> when it comes to reviews, one thing I don't agree with is the, when that phrase that people say, you know, if you liked my book, please leave a review. I don't agree with that. Um, I just say, I'd love your honest feedback because if someone says, you know, if you like my book, leave a review. Well, then that means if they're, if they're going to give you a three, four or five, then they'll leave you a review. But if they were going to give you a one or a two, they're not going to. Whereas I find value in any kind of, as long as it's a, a good constructive good quality, <laughs> right. You know, I, I, I've got a, I've got a, you know, a hard back. It doesn't, it doesn't bother me at this point. Um, so yeah, so I, I have asked them for, you know, just give me your, your honest feedback. Um, on, you know, a new book I might uh, publish, uh, a new puzzle book I might put out. Okay. We talked a little bit about puzzle creation software. So is that something that you recommend in general for someone who's just starting out? Um, I, I don't know how much these softwares are, but do you think it's a good idea for people to maybe do things by hand first and kind of see if they experience any success? Or is it better to just grab some software right off the bat, um, just in order to you know, streamline the process and save some time. Right. It, it's really going to come down to, to time versus money. You know, what do you have more of? Um, that's really what it's going to come down to, because if you're creating it yourself and there are very, very few, if any puzzle types that I've found that you can't create yourself, um, you can create your own word search in PowerPoint if you want. Um, as a matter of fact, I actually have a video on it, but you know, it's going to take you time. So if you have more time, than, than money, then yeah, absolutely do it yourself. I, I like the idea of doing things myself before I buy a software package, because that way it does a couple of things. It lets me know what the system is doing. So if yeah. something is, if something is wrong or the system is down or whatever, my business doesn't get affected. I can still produce. It might take me longer to produce it, but I can still do it. Um, but also it lets you appreciate what that software is doing. And then you can make an educated decision if whether or not the time that you're saving is worth the price of whatever you're looking at. So um, now my books, I do use, I do use software um, on most of them, but not a hundred percent of the book. You know what I mean? So like yeah. parts of the books are puzzle types that I absolutely use software for. If I can, if I can have a system do it for me or me do it manually, I've got, a, you know, a finite amount of time, especially with all the stuff that I've got going on. And so if I can do something that's going to be more efficient, so use the software, then I'll do that. And then I save my time for the ones that there are no software for. Right. Yeah. That's a really good way to look at it. Okay. So you've got a course, a puzzle book domination. I do. Yeah. Tell us about it. So puzzle book domination is, um, it's a course on how to create uh, puzzle pages and games yourself. Um, the, uh, the, the, the puzzles that are in there, I took a lot of time picking and choosing them because there's four criteria that they had to be in order to, to qualify. And one, obviously there are things I researched. Two, they had to be ones that um, you can create a quality version yourself. Uh, the third one is they all have sold for me. And then the fourth one, which is something that currently exists, but I can't promise it's going to be forever. And that is that they don't exist in any paid software. You know, if a software generator uh, creator is going to buy my course, he very well may go through and, and create a software that creates all of them. But as of when they were put in the course, they didn't exist in any paid software. So um, yeah, that's, that's what the, the kind of the foundation of it is is I wanted to give people um, a, a way to create these unique puzzle types that are still profitable. Um, but I didn't want to just do it all on the YouTube channel because 
like with line journals, if everybody has the free information out there, then the competition is going to be too high. And then it's going to be hard for anybody to, to really make a, you know, a significant income doing it. So, uh, but in, inside the course, I also have videos where I show you how to um, create a puzzle book brand, some tips on puzzle book covers, you know, what to include, what not to include. Yeah, it's very comprehensive. I was really impressed when I went through it the first time around. Um, I hadn't even heard of like, at least, I don't know, it's probably more than 50% of the puzzles that you go through in there. I it was just going like, what? I've never even yeah. heard of this. <laughs> So, I mean, that's great because, I mean, like we already said, your go-to kind of idea, if you're like, okay, I'm going to get into the puzzle book market. Well, I'm thinking straight away about crosswords, word searches, um, you know, Sudoku, and then you might find like, I don't know, three or four others just doing some research. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, some of these uh, more obscure ones, I think probably have a lot of potential because it's just really kind of an untapped market for those ones out there. Right. Yeah. No, I mean, and don't get me wrong. I'm especially with software. I, I do word searches. I do Sudokus, but those are just one of the 10 that are in my book. And then I have Hashiwaka Karos and Futushikis and things like that, that, that people, like you said, have never heard of. Yeah. So that's, that's great. That's what, that's what kind of draws people in um, that makes your book stand out is, you know, that, and that's why I said, you know, they, they buy mine and they don't jump to a competitor because the competitors don't have that. So you're, you're releasing an updated version of puzzle book domination. Okay. Today is what the 29th or something like that. 28. The 28th. Yeah. So your updated version is coming out when is it the April, 5th? April 5th. Yep. Okay. So I think that's going to be either the day after or the day before this video goes live. So what, what can you tell us about uh, in terms of the updates you know, what's new and improved for this latest version? The short answer is a lot. Um, the longer answer is uh, I, I, I listened to like, uh, I tried to listen to everybody, but um, we made probably three or four major advancements. Um, the first one is I listened to myself and uh, there were some headaches that I had with the, the platform that it was on. Um, it was on Thinkific. Thinkific is a great platform, but there were a lot of limitations to what I could do. So I basically had a custom platform made uh, for this course. Uh, so that was the, that was the first big thing, uh, but I wanted to make sure that it was as easy on the students as possible. And so for people that are currently in it, they probably will see very little difference other than the site that they go to. Uh, but as far as like the, uh, what they see, it's going to be very similar to what they're used to. I listened to the students, um, you know, I've got three or 400 students and uh, while, you know, I got great feedback as far as not only the content, but the success that they were seeing, um, something that was being said uh, frequently was that it's called puzzle book domination, but out of the 14 puzzle types that were there, um, a lot of them were games. And I was calling them puzzles because that's the way it was in my head, but really they were games. And, you know, I can admit when I'm wrong. So uh, I went full honey badger on, uh, on different, on different puzzle types. And again, using that same criteria where, you know, and that took me probably like eight months, um, in order to, to go through them and test them and, and make sure that they made, you know, that they actually sold for me and that I can make a quality one. So, um, we've, we had originally 14 puzzle slash game types. Now we'll have 27. Wow. Um, 15 of which are games. I mean, I'm sorry, 15 of which are puzzles. So we've got 15 puzzle types, 12 game types. So it technically is puzzle book domination because there's more puzzles than games. <laughs> and then I also, I wanted to give people um, ability to do trademark research, which some people just don't even know that they should do. Oh yeah. Uh, I wanted to make this course as evergreen as possible. And it, it would be naive for me to think that um, a puzzle type um, or a name or whatever that I'm suggesting in my course, even though it's trademark free when I recorded it and when I, you know, published the course, it'd be naive for me to think that, you know, a week, a year, you know, 10 years from now that it's still going to be trademark free. Um, in, in the U S alone, over a thousand trademarks are pushed through every single day. Wow. And so, um, so I did a video to show how to, you know, do trademark research. Um, 
And then I also, and this was a video I never planned on doing ever didn't plan on sharing it, but, um, people wanted a little bit more of the secret sauce. They wanted to know how I get my book, some of my books to be 1495 and 1995. So I begrudgingly did a, a video and included it in the course where I show how to, um, my three phase process, um, on how I go from the 899 books to some of them getting to that, the higher price point. Um, and that's uh, really useful. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then, and then the other big change that we made was, um, I listened to my potential students, um, between the YouTube channel and social media and emails, I get comments, um, at least once a week, if not once a day of people that want, wanted to do the course, but just couldn't afford it. And so they'd ask me for coupon code and I don't do coupons because I, I don't think it's fair to the people that paid full price. Um, you know, I, that said, I, I feel for, for that. I've been there, you know, where you're pinching pennies when you're first starting out. And so we've broken down into three different, what I call tiers. Um, I I'm not a big fan of, of click funnels, but, um, but I do see how, uh, I wanted to make sure that I'm able to offer something to pretty much anybody. Um, so we have the, the three, the three tiers. The first one is just called puzzle book domination. And it's, um, you, you start out with four, um, successful puzzle types. I mean, they're all, like I said, they all meet that criteria, um, including Hashi Waka Carols. Cause I know so many people will just love saying that. Um, <laughs> so that's included in there. Um, the, the trademark research video is included in that, that first one. So everybody has access to it. Um, I've also taken all of the puzzle book related videos from my YouTube channel and I've put that in there as well. So that way they don't have to jump around. Um, yeah, I might cut on my, my watch time, but I don't care. You know, I wanted people to, to be able to give them, um, make it as efficient on them as I could. Uh, and then the, the second tier is basically all the rest of the puzzle information. I've got a bonus section where I talk about um, what I said earlier about how to, you know, what to include and not include on your puzzle book covers, um, how to build a puzzle book brand, as well as in, in all of the puzzle modules and game modules, they, there's three different sections. There's the intro where I do a video where I just tell you about the puzzle or game type, a tutorial where I show you over my shoulder how to actually create it, and then a PDF file where it's the actual uh, instructions for the consumer. So the person using the book, how to actually do the puzzle since they are more unique puzzle types. Well, with the second tier of the uh, puzzle book domination, uh, I actually give you the PowerPoint files so you can change the trim size, change it however you want. So that you've got more than just the PDF, you actually have the PowerPoint file itself. Oh, that's handy. And then the third tier is what we call uh, puzzle book domination premium. And that's where we add in everything. That's where we add in the games, um, 12 games, uh, the video on how to make a custom game. So it'll be unique to your puzzle, to your puzzle book, game book, activity book, whatever you want to oh, call that's it. Very cool. And then that one, you actually get the editable PowerPoint files for all of the instructions for the games. That's great. Yeah. So it's, I mean, it, it's all inclusive and there should be something for every price point. That's awesome. I can't wait to go through it again and, and see what awesome value you've added since the last time. The first iteration was so great. So can't wait to see, uh, see what's new this time around. Yeah. There's, there's even more puzzles that you've never heard of. <laughs> oh, I can't wait. I was, yeah, I, I was, it was, my mind is still blown from seeing some of the, what, what is that? I've never yeah. even heard of that. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay. So before we go, what's, what's one tip that you could give anyone who's just starting out with puzzle books uh, that you could give them in order to, you know, hopefully achieve some of the success that you've had? Yeah. Um, it's, I, I would say just like with any kind of uh, business that you're running is, um, you know, make sure that you focus on a niche, something, you know, because if, again, if you try to create something for everybody, you're going to create it for nobody. So you really want to focus in on that niche and, 
then it just comes down to quality, quality cover, quality interior. Um, nothing. I mean, quality over quantity every time. Yeah, couldn't agree more. All right. Well, thanks so much, Keith. It was so great to have you back. And um, I've left a link down to Puzzle Book Domination uh, down in the description below. So if anyone wants to check that out, please do. Like he said, there's going to be something for everyone uh, in that course. So if you're thinking about dipping your toes into puzzle books, this is the way to get started. Please check that out. Link down below. And before we go, Keith, uh, let everyone know where they can find you if they want to find out a little bit more about you or some of the other services that you offer your YouTube channel, all that good stuff. Yeah. Uh, the best place to go would be, uh, I'm the most active on the YouTube channel, which is Keith Wheeler books. Um, and then in any one of those video descriptions, I've got links to, you know, my social media, but it's K Wheeler books. It all pretty much all social media, but Keith Wheeler books, YouTube is where I'm at the most. Awesome. And uh, I'll, I'll drop all those links down below in this video as well. All right. Thanks, Keith. Thanks we'll for having me. See you next time. Well, there you have it. Thank you so much for watching. Be sure to check out this video next for some more on low content publishing. And if low content publishing is brand new to you, then please check out my guide, which I've left a link to down below in the description for three steps to publishing your first low content book in less than a day. If you like this video, please hit the like button. Don't forget to subscribe and we'll see you next time. Thanks again for watching.